Okay, I see we have folks joining in now. I think Zoom is opening the waiting room, letting everyone in uh, slowly. So we'll we'll officially start in a couple of minutes, but I thought um, as everyone is coming in, we'll just go over a few housekeeping pieces. Okay, yes, okay. So hi everyone, my name is Victoria. I am a habitat manager um, here at the Canadian Wildlife Federation for our Rights of Way program. And I'm really excited to have you all. Um, and I'm sure many of you are already quite comfortable with Zoom, but just want to double check um, uh, for everything today. So if you're having any issues with audio, um, please just double check your audio settings. Uh, make sure that your speakers or your headphones are uh, connected to the Zoom platform. And if you're having any other technical issues, you can just send us a chat a message in the chat and we'll help you out as best as we can. We also have a question and answer function, um, and we'll be using that at the end of the presentation today. Um, so I encourage you to ask your questions throughout, um, but we'll just be responding to them at the end of the day, or end of the session, not the day. <laughs> um, and so I see we have people coming through. Um, I would like to encourage you to, to introduce yourselves in the chat as well. Um, like I said, my name is Victoria for those who are still coming on. I'm based in Ottawa um, and that's on the unceded and um, traditional territory of the Algonquin and Anishinaabek Nation. Uh, if you um, in the chat want to write where you're joining us from, if you know the um, traditional land that you're joining us from, please include that too. If you don't, um, there's a fantastic website called nativeland.ca and in a, just in a moment I'll put that link in the in the chat as well for you um, you can take a look um, after the session and you can write also maybe where you're joining from um, be great to to get to know where we have people coming from today oh it looks like the chat's disabled so let's see what we can do there hmm Maybe if I could ask Tracy, if you can look on the chat, I just can't access the settings at the moment. Might be that you can only say hello to the panelists. All right, well, we'll, we'll try and work through that technical issue as, as we're going, but see we have more and more here on the call. Um, I don't want to take up too much time because we have some exciting topics uh, to talk about today. Um, and first, I'll just do a little introduction to why it is that we're here today. Um, so you've been invited um, through our Rights of Way program um, here at the Canadian Wildlife Federation. And in this program, we work collaboratively with land managers um, to restore the breeding and migratory habitat for the monarch, as well as other pollinators um, that will benefit along energy and transportation rights of way. So that includes hydro, um, road size uh, in municipalities, could be pipeline easements, solar farms, and so on. So I know that there's a lot of representation here today from those, but also other places too that work with rights of way. And so we do this um, in a few different ways. So we have a growing Canada-wide network, and that's our Canadian chapter of the Rights of Way as Habitat Working Group. Um, and so this is uh, an offshoot from a U.S. group um, that began. And um, through this Canadian-wide network, we provide resources and training opportunities, just like this winter webinar series that we're here today for, as well as an annual workshop. So please stay tuned for details um, in your email about that later on. And we also have two regional networks. We have one in Eastern Ontario and one in Southwestern Ontario. And we facilitate peer-to-peer -peer technical training and habitat restoration. So sometimes that's in-person um, training events. And we also implement on-the-ground restoration. Um, and so for Eastern Ontario in particular, we're looking for additional partners to do restoration projects with this spring and summer. Um, so again, stay tuned for details in your email. But um, if you're interested about this and would like to learn more, you can give us an email. Again, I'll put that um, in the chat for everyone to have in just a moment. 
And uh, this is just some of her team um, that helps us uh, work away on our restoration projects. And you might find that some of these faces are familiar. Um, they certainly will become in, in the next few months as we do this webinar series. Um, for example, Tracy Atwell, who is our restoration ecologist, will be presenting for our next webinar in this series. Um, and that's taking place in February. And she'll be presenting about our 2022 pollinator um, meadow monitoring results. So this is a follow-up webinar to one that we had last year on our first year results. So um, come in and uh, listen in to hear um, what we have learned in that year's time. And then our final webinar in this series uh, will take place in March with the Texas Department of Transportation. And um, that will be with Sam Glinsky, who is a vegetation specialist, and he'll be presenting on the um, Department of Transportation's wildflower program. They have been implementing vegetation management practices since 1932. So they have decades and decades of experience. Um, and are, we'll talk about uh, the practices that they've learned over the years and um, the benefits to roadsides that uh, also go beyond the road. So um, please be sure to, to register for that. The registration wasn't in the original um, invite um, and it is now available. You will receive an email, but I'll also, I'll put a link in the chat if you'd like to access that today. And this um, webinar is being recorded today. Uh, so if you uh, would like to go back and reference it later on, you can. It'll be emailed um, when ready, or it'll be on our YouTube page. Um, it'll be on our web page. And also we have a LinkedIn group specifically for our Canada Wide Network. Again, I'll put the link in the chat. <laughs> and uh, feel free to join if you'd like to learn more about activities like this, um, but also other just you know resources and articles about things that are relevant um, to restoration on rights of way. Okay, so without further ado, I'm really looking forward um, to, to our presentation today. We have Dr. Liz Kojal, um, who is the founder of MycoBloom and is also a scientist at the University of Indiana. Um, she has obtained her PhD from that same university and um, has more than 10 years of experience using endomycorrhizal fungi and prairie restorations um, in Indiana, Illinois, in Kansas, and Oklahoma, and Missouri. And her research indicates that rare and late successional plant species are massively responsive to mycorrhizal fungi and has observed that prairie fungi are extremely beneficial to a diverse range of plants. So before I, I pass things on, um, I think it would be really great to get a bit of a feel of us who are on the call today. Uh, oh, sorry about that. And uh, well, that's okay. Uh, there we go. To get a bit of a feel of what our experience is coming into this webinar with mycorrhiza. So I'm going to launch a poll. Please bear with me. Hopefully you can see it now. Um, and please let us know if you have experience using mycorrhiza in a restoration project. So um, this could be specifically with your, um, your workplace that you do restoration work. Maybe it's outside of your workplace and it's something that you do on the side. Um, at CWF, we have been trial trialing mycorrhiza in some of our restoration projects for the last year. And so we're really excited to, to see the continued benefits of that. Um, and we're looking forward to doing some more sites this spring as well. Okay, so I'm seeing we have a pretty good percentage here. Seems like we have, I'm not sure if you can see the results here yet, but um, on my side, we have about 18% who are saying that they do have experience and about 82% who are showing, or a little bit more, who they don't yet have experience. So that is meaning that we definitely have a lot that we can learn today, uh, which is really awesome. And so I will pass things on to Liz and I will stop sharing my screen for you. <laughs> there we go. Okay. Thanks. And I definitely have a lot of experience with mycorrhizae and restoration. So I'm happy to share with you today. Look good. Everything looks so good. So, one Thank uh, you. brief correction to that intro I'm actually at the University of Kansas now. Um, I did my PhD at Indiana University, but now I am Sorry in the center that. of the US in Kansas. No worries. <laughs> so I thought I'd spend a little bit of time this morning just, just describing the system I worked in the most often, which is the tall grass prairie. And I first had experience in this system in grad school, even though I lived within the range, I never saw a prairie until I was in my mid-20s. 
And what struck me about these systems is their incredible diversity that comprise of many long-lived grasses, forbs, and legumes. And in a one meter step, some of these old growth prairies that are undisturbed and have been prairies since glaciation, more than 10,000 years, these systems might have as many as 20 different plant species in a single step. So they're incredibly diverse and incredibly beautiful. And here's a map of the historical range of the prairie in the US. Sorry, we chopped off Canada here, but of course um, these systems did extend up into Canada and there's similar grasslands in other parts of Canada and the Eastern US and um, all the way down into Mexico too. There's overlapping species distribution. But so most of my research uh, occurs in the tall grass prairie, which on this map is that dark green section on the right. And this system, uh, while it once was massive, is incredibly threatened. So today, less than 4% of the system remains intact. And I'll take, for example, near to where I grew up, the state of Illinois, around 200 years ago was covered about 60% in land mass by this tall grass prairie system. And today, about 200 years later, less than 0.01% remains intact. And so what happened to all of these spaces? Uh, the answer to that is soil. These systems made incredibly nutrient rich soil, which were also very easy to plow with the advent of the steel plow. So today, much of the tall grass prairie where I conduct a lot of my restoration work is row crop agriculture. And on the Western range of the prairie, the more short and medium grasses, uh, these lands are subject to grazing. And both of these types of things can be disturbances in the system. Overgrazing can lead to loss of species in the prairie. And of course, the brown fields of row crop agriculture has massive um, disturbances, including total loss of species distributions, water erosion problems, um, many things I'm sure you're familiar with. So to mitigate some of these environmental concerns, we have started doing massive restorations of these systems. And generally this works by going to a system we um, qualify as native and good. So in this case, it's often an old growth prairie that is a prairie that's been a prairie and never experienced plow. And we collect all the seeds from that prairie and dump it onto the land we wanna store, whether that's a right of way, an ag field, a yard, and that is restoration. And we've gotten really good at getting native plants to establish, which is fantastic. However, restorations never recover the species diversity of that seed mix. And generally restorations can have two to five times lower species richness relative to a diverse native prairie in the same location. And here's some examples of what can happen in these systems. Sometimes native plants establish and you might have full native cover, but it's really low diversity. This is a prairie restoration that I visited in Kansas that had about 99% big blue stem and no other plant species. Oftentimes we might get other things such as forbs for our pollinators, um, but even though this picture in the bottom center is very beautiful and um, appears to be diverse, it actually only has about three different forbs flowering and they all tend to flower in this site at the beginning of the spring. So not super diverse. And of course, there's many issues with non-native establishment and also weedy plant establishment. And so often we don't restore the native diversity that we were hoping to. And this is a problem because diverse systems are better. They're more stable, they're more resistant to invasive pressures and more resistant to drought and climate change. So today, I'm gonna to show you some steps we use to bypass those sort of in-between low diversity restorations to try to increase the diversity in our restoration to more closely match what is observed in our intact native prairies. And hopefully I'm gonna convince you the key to that is soil microbes. Specifically, the type of little microbes that I work with, which are called our buscular mycorrhizal fungi. And so when I say mycorrhizae, um, many people, think of these types of things, morels and their favorite puffballs or um, whatever mushrooms they like to hunt in the woods. And some of these are mycorrhizal fungi, but the type that I work with are subterranean. They're called arbuscular mycorrhizal fungi. And here is a picture of them. They are an endomycorrhizal fungi, which translates to mean endo within mycofungus rhizal root. So these fungi live in soil and inside of plant roots. And so here I'm showing you an image of a microscope ocular. 
So just one little eyepiece. And the, the long thing in the center, I can point with my pointer, that'll be more useful. This whole thing is a plant root that I've cleared of all of its color. And I put a special stain on that plant root that makes those fungal structures turn dark blue. So here I'm showing some of the spores of that mycorrhizae and these hyphae that are growing um, outside of the root and eventually inside of the root where they move in between these uh, rows of plant cells. And so these mycorrhizal fungi, which I usually call AMF or AM fungi for short, have two main forms, spores and hyphae. So here I'm showing you the, their asexually produced spores, which we tell the different species of these fungi apart, generally using spores and the different color, shape and size of the spores are um, indicative of species. So for example, these huge white ones here are all one species, and that's actually one of the species large enough to see these spores with the naked eye. Um, but many of them are too small too. And for example, here is another species here, Funiliformis mossy. And so the spores are sort of like their seed, they're their reproductive structure, and they're really dormant. And another way that they can travel is um, via spores on the roots of little, or on the feet of little critters, and sometimes on the wind. These fungi spend most of their time, however, in hyphal form. So here I'm showing a single spore germinating hyphae. And so hyphae is this long filamentous tube that can branch in all directions in the soil. And this hyphae is excellent at acquiring soil nutrients. And so these hyphal segments reach into these micro pockets of soil and they're especially able um, to collect inorganic phosphorus. And so when a plant lands in the soil and their little rootlets start to interact with these hyphal segments, um, this endomycorrhizal interaction begins where that fungi will um, colonize those plant roots. And the plants will fix carbon from the atmosphere and turn that into sugar, which it feeds the fungi. And so the fungi are obligately dependent on their plant um, for that sugar to grow. And in exchange, the fungi use their fast hyphal network to collect these soil nutrients phosphorus, um, calcium, nitrogen, many other things, and they transplant that to their plant host. So it's a nutrient exchange that maintains this plant and AM fungal symbiosis. And in associating with these fungi, plants can actually grow much larger due to that increased foraging area of their roots. And so mycorrhizal communities um, differ a lot in between the native habitats that I studied, such as these old growth intact um, tall grass prairies versus the restoration landscapes I work in. So for example, in prairie soil, soil, we see a bunch of different mycorrhizae. They tend to be really beneficial, um, although there's a range of how beneficial these mycorrhizae are, versus in many of the restoration landscapes I work in, which is often um, post-till areas, such as uh, brownfields, um, lawn areas that have been converted, for example. And um, this is also equivalent to like growing a plant in a pot that doesn't have uh, mycorrhizae. So these environments tend to have fewer mycorrhizae and the mycorrhizae that are there tend to be less beneficial than what we observe in our native habitats. And this is a problem for plants because plants have different mycorrhizal needs. And so if we look at the plant trait of root branching, here I'm showing a bunch of different prairie grasses and forbs and legumes with their um, associated root architecture. So you might recognize some of them in the center here. We have our echinacea, which has a medium length root with very little root branching. And that's in contrast right next to it. Um, this big blue stem has, I guess, a medium to long root system, but a ton of finely branched roots. And so it's thought that the plants like Echinacea and Lytris that have these limited root architectures, so these coarse roots with little branching, these plants are more strongly dependent on these mycorrhizae because they really require that association and that expansion um, into that mycorrhizal network to compete for that soil nutrients. And so we can test how much a plant may or may not like mycorrhizae pretty simply in the greenhouse. And we do that um, by doing something I call a mycorrhizal response ratio test. And all you do is you grow uh, a plant or a, a replicate number of plants with mycorrhizae and a number of replicate plants without mycorrhizae and look at that weight ratio. And so on this scale here, if a plant grows the same with and without mycorrhizae, whether that be big or small, it'll have a low mycorrhizal responsiveness of about one. And on this top panel here, if the plant is growing 20 times larger with mycorrhizae than without, it'll have a mycorrhizal responsiveness of 20. 
So if we look at a bunch of different plants from across the successional gradient, where we have our early successional plants, which are plant species that are, um, sometimes I'll put non-native plants in that category as well, but our weedy plants, our annual plants, and some of our perennials that grow and reproduce really quickly, these are our early successional plants. Um, and then on the right side here, our late successional plant species tend to be the species that are endemic to prairie. Um, they're really hard to restore if you can restore these species at all. These tend to be slower growing plant species that are really long lived. Um, and so I decide if a plant is early or late successional using the coefficient, the conservation coefficient scores. And so if we look at a bunch of different plants from across this response gradient of succession, um, every little dot here is a single plant species. So we can see that our very early and early successional plants have a low mycorrhizal responsiveness. It tends to hover generally about one. There's a couple that have a or slightly more responsive to their native mycorrhizal fungi. In contrast, these middle and late successional plants are all strongly responsive to their native mycorrhizae and they grow anywhere from three to, in some cases, um, 25 times larger with their native mycorrhizae than without. And that doesn't mean that these late successional plants are growing you know, the size of trucks when they have their mycorrhizae. What it means is that when they don't have their mycorrhizae, they're essentially not growing. And so that's one reason these plants might be missing in restoration. And if we look at how this data maps onto root architecture, we see that these plants with high mycorrhizal responsivenesses here on the left tend to have fewer root tips than um, the plants with low mycorrhizal responsiveness on this right graph, which have more roots and are less mycorrhizal. So this does match up with our expectation of how root architecture affects mycorrhizal responsiveness. So let's take this data and um, pick out a few different species from this data set and see what might happen to these given plant species in restoration. So on our early successional plant, I'm choosing Rudbeckia herta, which is a plant that across all the different studies we've worked in tends to have a really low mycorrhizal responsiveness if it responds at all, um, but it's usually about one, which means no response. Versus our um, later successional plant, rattlesnake master Rungium mycofolium, tends to have a mycorrhizal response of about 10. So if we take these two plant species and we seed them both into this disturbed habitat, we would expect that a bunch of root vecchia would establish and almost no rattlesnake master would establish. And that's because Rebecca herta doesn't care about what fungi is there, they're gonna establish well, versus these rattlesnake master might have difficulty establishing. However, if we transplant not only those seeds, but the microbes from the prairie, we might expect this to happen. We might expect more of these middle and late successional plants that have these strong relationships with mycorrhizae to be able to establish because they have the partners that they depend on for their survival um, with that inocula. And so we call this movement of microbes uh, either inocula or sometimes a microbial transplant. And so in the lab group that I work in at uh, now the University of Kansas, the Beaver Schultz lab group, we've done these sort of microbial transplants uh, dozens and dozens of times. So here are just some examples in the US where we have conducted this work and have published papers on these microbial transplants. Um, so today I'm gonna be talking to you about a few of these case studies and I think you're really gonna have some fun. Um, I also have, if anybody's interested in um, mycorrhizal responsiveness of given plant species, I do have a PDF available of the data set we've accumulated so far in the lab, which is about 200 different plant species where um, these numbers here are the percent uh, change in growth, whether that's positive or in some cases negative um, with the native fungi for these plant species. So um, I can um, get with Victoria if anybody's interested in that, I can send that PDF along. So before I go on, I just wanted to say that not all microbes are the same. So there's been a ton of data out there published recently warning us as restoration practitioners of the dangers of inoculants in restoration. Um, things such as they might not work or they might actually be harmful to our restoration. And one study that came out just about a year ago in the bottom left, the Global Evaluation of Commercial Buscular Mycorrhizal Inoculants. Um, this is a study, they mostly use inocula from Europe and Australia, but a couple from the US. And they found that 
87% of the inocula that they tested, the commercial mycorrhizal inoculants, were not viable. Um, so that's incredibly disappointing and um, embarrassing for the field of commercial inoculants. There's also been a ton of other studies out there um, warning us that even if you have a commercial inoculant that might be viable, um, it might not work very well in your restoration. So all these studies, and there's been a bunch out there, including meta-analysis, show that in general, native mycorrhizal inoculants improve restoration success, whereas commercial mycorrhizal inoculants uh, don't and can sometimes be harmful. So this is a pretty consistent pattern um, in restoration. And why is this? So just like plants, fungi can be native. These am fungi um, can be locally adapted to the water, availability to the nutrients and the climate and the ecosystem, even the plant species that you restore. Um, so the problem with commercial fungi is that almost no microbial products are native to a region, including most commercial fungi. So many of these products might have isolates of mycorrhizae from across the world, and they're not necessarily um, endemic to the tall grass prairie you're trying to restore in uh, Canada, for example. And so I have only done a few studies investing in commercial inocula, but I wanted to highlight one of them, um, which is a one that just came out in Ecosphere, where I looked at a bunch of different milkweed species and their response to native and commercial inocula. So I'm sure many of you are familiar with milkweeds and the um, monarch butterfly. I just really like to highlight them because they're just such a champion um, to the general population about the importance of interactions and ecology. So for example, my dad is the kind of guy who mows his yard three times a week and sprays every dandelion with you know, herbicide, has heard the story of the monarch butterfly and actually let milkweed grow in his yard for the monarchs and he had a little caterpillar. And so it's actually um, they're just an amazing champion for diversity and for people um, starting to care about diversity in these systems. So um, anyway, I love them. But so in this data set, what I'm showing you here is on average, the growth of these milkweeds with our native mycorrhizal fungi from Kansas versus um, in the center, a commercial professional mix of mycorrhizae and a non-inoculated control. So for some plants, um, this was more dramatic than in other plant species, but on average, just as a response, we saw about a 15% improvement in growth with our native inocula versus about a 15% reduction in growth with that commercial promix. And we also, for this study, looked at the latex that were exuded by these different plant species um, given the different inocula. And we saw improvements in latex production with native fungi, but not really with that commercial fungi. And so latex production is what sustains the monarch butterflies. And um, so this data set just shows that how these plants are treated before they're planted or seeded out does have effect not only on the growth and um, latex production of these plants, but it can have cascading effects to the insects and pollinators that depend on them too. So for, uh, I'm gonna jump now into a bunch of different case studies in the prairie where we've done these microbial transplants. And for all of these talks, I'm gonna be describing only native mycorrhizal transplants. So that's something to keep in mind for these data sets. And so I'll just generally explain the different types of inocula that we've used and how we've done them before we get into the case study. So in some of the work that we've done, um, the inocula we use is whole soil. And so whole soil is awesome in that it's super easy to collect. What we do is we go to a reference ecosystem, generally tall grass prairie, and collect small amounts of soil and transport that to our restoration. So the benefits of that, it's really easy to collect and it has everything that you need in it, including AM fungi, um, beneficial bacteria, pathogens, sometimes even seeds or plants. However, um, these pockets are becoming increasingly difficult to find as the system is more and more disturbed. And also digging up the system is, is a huge disturbance in and of itself. And so, for example, in the state of Illinois, where less than 0.01% of prairie remains, land managers there are definitely not going to allow us to dig up these precious um, remnant prairies for inocula. So because of that, we've started inoculating with specific microbes that we think are important from those whole soil. And these are targeted inoculations. So I'll be talking a lot about 
just inoculating with AM fungi, but some people also might just inoculate with things such as rhizobia, uh, beneficial bacteria, or pathogens um, to inhibit some of these non-natives or aggressive plant species. And so for this, what we do is we go to that same old growth prairie and collect soil. However, we just take a small amount of soil and collect the microbes in that soil. And then we bulk propagate that up in the lab. Um, and so the benefits are there's less disturbance to that native system. We can regrow these inoculum in the lab indefinitely, which is awesome. However, um, it does require generally a lab to make this function, which can be very expensive. And there are commercial products out there for a bunch of different microbes. However, um, as I mentioned before, these things can vary widely. And so I'll talk about the number of different ways that we have um, thrown these inocula out into the environment. And right away, I'm just going to eliminate some that we have found don't work very well. And those are all of the ones on the bottom. So people always want to surface broadcast or drench these inocula, which I agree would be amazing. It'd be so easy just to water it on top. However, it just doesn't work with the ecology and the biology of these fungi. So this, these methods leave the microbes on the soil surface. And most of our prairie microbes are subterranean meaning they spend their whole life cycle below ground, so they don't like being dried out. They don't like um, being exposed to the sun that will kill them. We haven't had any luck with seed balls, although I'd like to try some more work with seed balls. Another question we get a lot is, can you coat these mycorrhizae on our seeds and we can just throw our seeds out with the microbes? Um, but these abuscular mycorrhizae especially are, they're actually quite macro for microbes. So you can see the spores of some of these with the naked eye. And some of these spores are just simply too large. So here I'm showing a um, seed of, I think an echinacea and at scale, just to the left of it, the spores, the relative size of these spores. So as you can see, these spores are some of them about a quarter of the width of that seed. They're just simply too large to stick onto that seed. The ways that we have found to work really well in restoration to distribute these inocula on top all have in common some way of working that inocula below the soil surface. So I'm gonna first start describing a couple of studies where we've used this inoculated nurse plant technique here on the right, which is where we have a pot and it's full of some background growing media and we inoculate about 10% by volume. Then we plant inside of it our little seedling and let that grow for a few weeks before transplanting in the field. And we love this technique because we know the fungi or the microbes have a great host to support them and feed them um, right away as they're being transplanted. And um, it also works at inocula below ground. And we've only done a handful of studies with seed drill, but so far it seems really successful with these microbes. Um, we tend to grow our cultures in a granular inocula mix, which is large enough to, um, or small enough to fit inside of the large box of a seed drill generally. And I'll also be showing some studies where we did surface broadcast that inocula, um, but immediately tilled it in after either with a rototiller or a tractor implement. Um, and so these are some of the ways that we found to be successful. And I also have some inoculation instructions I've compiled for my small biz um, microbloom, and I can provide that PDF available too if anybody is interested in reading that info. So um, I've thrown a lot at you. Um, get ready for some graphs now. So I'm gonna show you some case studies and we're gonna start at the small scale um, in the pots and plug section and then get into more seeded restorations and um, then seeded projects at larger scale. So let's start with a pot study. And this is something that you could do in your greenhouse or um, in a nursery that you collaborate with to test how microbes might affect your system. So for this study, I had pots that I filled with um, disturbed soil, which was represented by this tractor and the low diversity fungi picture here. And I had pots that I filled with that same soil and I added just the native mycorrhizae from tall grass prairie that I had collected. So I put these all in these big pots and then I seeded these pots with the same seeded mixture. Um, so I wanted to test the restoration mix I was gonna use. So it had about 40 species. I also seeded with some non-native plants that I collected from that same site to see um, how these different plants would compete given these different microbial treatments. And so here's what these pots looked like at about 50 days. Um, all the pots were totally just blowing out with plants, um, tons of plants in every pot. So there was no difference in total biomass. However, some interesting patterns started to emerge when we began to look at that native versus non-native ratio. And so for that, what we did is we collected all the above ground biomass and then we took it to the lab and sorted it by species here. 
And then the second panel I'm showing you is that biomass. So in the disturbed soil, there was about even non-native and native seed mix. However, with the addition of just a small amount of AM fungi from that system, we saw that non-native plants were inhibited while native plants um, ended up dominating in these systems with that native mycorrhizae. And when we dove into that data even deeper, looking at what plants were present, um, here's what we find. Generally, diversity was a lot higher in those pots inoculated also with AM fungi on top of that disturbed soil. And we also saw more of these late succession of plants. So here um, on the left is the species list of the top 11 most abundant plants with AMF and on the right with no AMF. So the late successional plants are in green and underlined. So we see more late successional plants establishing with these AMF on top of that disturbed soil. And they're more abundant in these systems, which is fantastic. Um, so just to summarize this little pot study that I did before I started the restoration work at Kansas, I'm gonna describe um, for later in the talk. Adding these native late successional fungi improved diversity while also reducing non-native weeds and had an accrued improvement of late successional plant establishment. So I uh, concluded that via this study, adding microbes to the system would be a beneficial thing. So I was ready to take this data out into the field. Let's do it. Um, so the first study I wanna talk about is uh, one where I used plugs, which are, what I call this inoculated nurse plant technique. So I had these pots filled with soil from my site and added a tablespoon of native mycorrhizae to those pots. So this data set's um, more relevant to people who use plugs or plant plugs in the fields or seedlings in the field. And so this site was um, at a nature center in Indiana actually, and they didn't want me to put any sort of herbicide down on the site nor to till the site. So we put down this weed mat to sort of solarize the weeds for a few weeks before we initiated this experiment. And it worked really well. You can see the borders of um, the knockback here where the turf grass, a lot of clovers um, popping up in the background. But for the most part, these plants were knocked back, although they definitely weren't dead. They shot up a few weeks later, but I was hoping it would knock back that um, turf grass enough to allow my baby, baby seedlings to establish. So for this trial, I had 60 different inoculated plugs um, I chose eight early and eight late successional plants. I also seeded the whole thing with 60 species. And so within a given plot here, all these little seedlings would have the same inoculation treatment and the inoculation treatments would differ by the different plots that um, further in the background. And so for this study, I wanted to see how important individual species of AM fungi might be. So my fungal treatments included um, the top number one through four here are four individual species of AMF that I added to these um, inoculated nurse plants. Treatment five was a mixture of all those species and treatment six was nothing. So just those plugs um, being not inoculated. So let's look at what happened these plugs the end of the first year. This is the growth of these plugs on average. Um, and so, I'm gonna show a couple panels that have the same sort of format where on the left in orange is my native mixture of AM fungi. In the center are my four AM single species of AM fungi and on the right in black is that non-inoculated control. So just the plugs with no um, prairie mycorrhizae added. So you can see here that adding any prairie fungi um, really improved the growth of these plugs um, and the mixture tended to perform about as well as that best single species. So that's pretty cool data, I thought. Um, looking at that plug survival at the end of, I think this is the second year survival, but you can check the paper. It's 2017 Journal of Applied Ecology um, if you're interested in this data set. What we saw was about a 75 to 80% survival of those plugs with our four species native fungal mixture versus about a 35% without inocula. So um, about double the responsiveness in terms of plant survival with inoculation in the field at the end of the second year. And if we looked at plant species, um, so on average, there was more late successional plants with inocula and with certain fungal species, but what species established well um, tended to depend on what mycorrhizae were present in that mixture. So here's one of my favorite prairie forbs, the rattlesnake master. It established really well in our um, four species mix and with a spinosa here. 
Here's another plant I like a lot. Um, also established pretty well with our mixture, but it preferred this other species, Entrophospora infrequens here in blue. And there were yet other late successional species such as big blue stem, which is considered um, late successional in that restoration range that established really well regardless of inoculation treatment. So how much a plant um, depended on fungi um, seemed to play out here in the field as well. And so one other last thing I wanted to point out was that we also saw a change in who was flowering at the end of second year based on inoculation. So I sort of just truncated, truncated this data to plugs that had our native mix versus not. And so if you didn't inoculate, there was a bunch of really sessional plants that were flowering at uh, the end of that second year. Versus if you inoculated, there was also some early sessional flowering, but a lot of these late sessional plants um, were flowering at peak times in the year. And these plants are some of these high coefficient of conservatism plants, species with high CC scores, such as the lead plant and dahlia, um, which we observed to start in, to flower even after the end of the second year in this trial, which is um, really amazing data and also very beautiful to see. And th because these plants are long-lived, late sessional plants are gonna be in that prairie for a long time. Okay, um, jump to the next case study which also used these inoculated plugs. Um, but for this trial, what I wanted to compare was adding whole soil from a remnant prairie versus just our AM fungi. So whole soil is much more diverse than what we typically include with our um, native prairie mixes. So in the last study, we included four species of AM fungi. We'd try to get our mixtures of late successional inocula of AMF as diverse as possible, but generally that is between seven and 15 species of AM fungi. Versus in a whole soil, you might see uh, hundreds of species of fungi. So we wanted to look at the relative role of these two things. And so this trial is going to be um, relevant to people who use plugs in the field. We're also going to be looking at some um, broadcast seed data for this. So it's uh, relevant to people who do seed-based restoration too. So this is a set of studies using that whole soil where we collected um, mycorrhizae and whole soil inocula from prairies across the Midwest. So here we have these five locations um, in these red circles on the map where we did these restorations. And so at all these sites, we collected um, native inocula from a prairie. We also grew just AM fungi out of that same inocula. And then we had a ton of different plants we were looking at in these studies. We monitored about 3,200 seedlings across the five studies, and they were all late sessional grasses, forbs, and legumes. And we distribute our inocula using this inoculated nurse plant technique. So we had our little pots where we put about a tablespoon of inocula with a small plug and planted those in the field. And so we planted our nurse plants along the center row of our plots here, which were um, about four by four meters in our trial. And then we seeded the whole plots and the aisles and everything, um, the acre of about an acre per site with a native seed mixture. And we also, at one meter away every year, would monitor the <clears throat> diversity of that recruited seed mix. So I'll present both the plug and the diversity data here today. So here's what happened with our inoculated nurse plant pug plugs. The first year, we, on average across all these sites, we saw about a 40% improvement in survival and about a 30% improvement in growth with any inocula. So pretty similar to my uh, previous study. We also saw that the aim fungi performed about as well as that whole soil inocula. And so this pattern continued um, over the years that we followed the study, although nurse plant survival tended to decline over time, that relationship of improvement with inoculation persisted. So if we next look at what happened one beater away from that inocula, um, to the resulting plant community, this is data presented from the third year of the study. We saw that diversity was improved slightly with our AM fungi, fungi, fungi inocula, and was actually slightly inhibited with that whole soil, possibly because of um, pathogens in that. We, we don't really know why it inhibited relative to the control. Another interesting pattern we observed in this study was that the proportion of these plots that were invaded by a non-native plant, which um, varied across sites, on average across all these sites, was about 25 to 30 percent lower with AM fungi than with the whole soil and the non-inoculated control. 
So these plants are seemingly inhibiting non-native plants either directly or possibly indirectly um, via promotion of native plant diversity. So just to briefly summarize this trial, um, we found that the AM fungi inocula performed pretty similar to the whole soil, especially for those um, nurse plant seedlings. We saw improvements in growth and survival. However, for the seeded plant species about a meter away, we saw the AIM fungi tended to be a little superior. We saw that improvement in native diversity and that reduction in non-native abundance that wasn't observed with that whole soil inocula. Um, and so we got some hot um, new data that I'm not going to present, but I just wanted to highlight because it's so exciting. So we revisited these one site, one of these sites about eight years later, which is a rare treat in sciences because we often um, work on grants that last, you know, two to four years, and then we have to move on to the next grant and the next study site and so on. So we had the rare uh, treat of having a site in uh, under management for eight years and we revisited and these patterns did still hold of plugs being um, more likely to have survived with inocula, especially AM fungi, and these plant community um, composition changes depending on inocula. So that's really exciting data on some of these long-term effects, and I hope to present that uh, maybe next time you hear me talk. So this data is also super cool. If you remember the example of Illinois, where less than 1% of prairie remains intact, there's just very little microbial inocula available for donation. So this data is super cool in that it shows you can just take a small amount of soil from those spaces, propagate the important microbes and put that into restoration and have an effect. So this is a viable restoration tool. Okay, so the last case study, um, this one is investigating. So we have these mycorrhizae, we know they're really important restoration. Um, how much do we have to put out there to see an effect? Is it handfuls or is it dump truck loads per acre? And this study is gonna be most relevant to seed-based planting and restoration at scale. And this data was really inspired by some discrepancies I observed in um, the different inoculations we've used in science versus what commercial producers of inocula recommend to put in the field. So here I'm showing you this chart of recommended gallons per acre um, that have been used in science which in this beaver 2003 was literally about dump trucks per acre um, applied at small scale, but still not feasible for restoration versus some of these um, commercial products here, which start with Megobloom and going on down. And there's a ton, there's a, I don't even know how many products available out there, but they all have in common really low um, application rates. And so just to highlight that last study I showed with that whole soil versus is, um, AMF in the field. This is one of the lowest densities of inoculation um, trials that I found out there, and it's still much higher than what is recommended by these commercial products. So that used about um, 16 gallons per acre, 40 liters per hectare. So still higher than any of these commercial products. So is it discrepancy we see where in science, native microbial inoculations work and these commercial fungi don't work? Is that related to inoculation density? Um, so that was the sort of thought process I was going through when I designed this study. So what I did is I went to my disturbed location, which is the old Brome field, and I added my seed mix to that site, which is about, um, I think in this trial, 47 species. But I didn't want to compare commercial versus native inoculate in this trial because um, we I feel like I already know the answer to that. But I did want to look at this uh, inoculation density gradient. So I had all these plots where I applied basically dump truck loads um, to the plots, going all the way down to adding very little mycorrhizae to the plots and my non-inoculated controls. So I had a ton of plots in this trial, about 72. And I applied my inocula, which is shown here in the bottom right, was a granular mixture. So I surface broadcast that with my seeds and then I tilled everything in with the hand tiller um, implement. It was slightly larger than that, but still was a lot of work. And so my plots here were four by four meters, and this is what they looked like the first year. They're incredibly weedy, um, ton of foxtail, but did anything happen in these trials? So to answer that question, we took these sort of like buzz cutter implements and we mowed these um, little 10 centimeter strips down the two, two areas of the plot. 
we collected all that biomass and took that back into the lab to look at what plant species established. And so here's a picture of what that looks like. Um, all these little piles are an individual plant species. So the bigger the pile, like this one, the more abundance it has versus this little pile. Um, we just found one little seedling. And so here I'm gonna show you now that biomass across my inoculation density gradient. So on the left is my non-inoculated plots where this is one plot and this second panel is a second plot. I also uh, broke that biomass down between the non-seeded biomass. So biomass um, this is a lot of foxtail and whatever was recruited in the seed bank versus what I seeded into those plots. So without inocula, we saw very few native establishment in um, some of our plots. As we added more inocula, we saw uh, more native plant species and they were more abundant. And this pattern generally persisted wherein we looked at our highest inoculation density plots, we saw the most native plants and they were the most abundant. And remember these are little six or 10 centimeters um, strips down there. They're about a 0.6 meter um, plot uh, in total. So just a small space, but still we're seeing many different plant species. So if you prefer looking at data versus pictures, um, you're gonna love these graphs, which is showing this data um, across this inoculation density where on the bottom of these graphs on the left, those white open circles are our non-inoculated plots. The gray circles in the middle are our sort of medium or low density inoculations representing uh, commercial recommendations. And on the black, is more representative of those high volumes of inocula, high densities of inoculation we use in science. So in these different panels, what I'm showing, as you add more and more inocula, so going from white to black, we saw this improvement in native abundance that first year. Now, we also have revisited these plots. Um, this is some fresh data from the fourth year which these plots are looking much better, but we still see this pattern holding where native diversity tended to incre increase and improve with higher inoculation densities and non-native abundance tended to decrease with more and more inocula. Interestingly, we started to see this improvement in um, a reduction of non-natives starting at the basically any amount of inocula. So right around two kilograms per hectare, we saw a reduction in non-native abundance. And so let's just jump in a little bit deeper into this data. I know you're probably getting tired, but there's not that many panels left, I promise. So on the left, we're gonna be comparing our non-native plants. Um, this is by functional group. So this is our non-native grasses, and this is our native grasses on the right. Um, so looking at this inoculation density effect on our non-native grasses, we saw as we added inocula, we saw a reduction in non-native grasses and promotion of native grasses. For legumes, the non-natives didn't tend to care too much about um, inocula, but we saw this really strong improvement of native legume establishment and abundance with increasing densities of inocula. And concerning forbs, we saw a reduction of non-native forb abundance with increasing density of some inocula. And our native forbs um, in this particular trial, year four, didn't really seem to care. This is driven um, largely by helianthus establishment. So if you wanna think about species, um, this will be my last panel, I promise. Oh shoot, it's coming up. Um, I just wanted to highlight legumes because time and time again, land managers come to me either um, with my University of Kansas hat or my Michael Bloom hat. And they say, we can't get native legumes to establish on our restoration. Um, and this data is highlighting how important it is to have a microbial community for these native legumes. So we saw a ton of early successional legumes such as Camicrista and Dismanthus established in these restorations. But as we added inocula, we tended to see these more mid and late successional plants like lead plant establish with inoculation. So this is, um, the study is a great example of a tool you can use to establish legumes in your seed-based restoration. And this is the last panel, I absolutely promise. So this is looking at the given species that establish in the plots. And so I broke the data up, sort of simplified it to, on the left, this panel is a non-inoculated. In the center is all those plots with low densities of inocula. And on the right is all those plots um, where we use high densities of inocula. 
So looking at these top ABC, what I'm showing here is that the dominant plant species were pretty much the same in these plots. So lots of Helianthus, uh, Monarda, Ritibida, the things you expect to see in a seed-based restoration. However, some interesting patterns tended to emerge when we looked at the subdominant species. So I think it was 11 through 20 or something like that, or six through 20 um, in these plots. So without inoculation, we saw the most non-native plants and they were more abundant in these plots. But as we added inocula here, we saw fewer non-native plants, so fewer red bars, and more late successional plants, which are these black bars. And this pattern continued to our highest density inoculation plots, where we saw the fewest non-natives establish and a really good establishment of these late successional plants, including our late successional plants like Baptisia, for example. So just to summarize everything um, from all these different case studies in one slide, does our native mycorrhizae help in restoration? Yes, uh, we find that it can improve native diversity, especially for late successional plants and legumes. We also found um, across both of these studies and other studies in the lab, this reduction in non-native plants and weeded plant species. And so how much do we need to add to restoration? It depends on your restoration goal. So the more the merrier considering legumes, we didn't, that was a, that line was very straight. Um, the more you added, the more legumes you observed in that study. And so, um, but any amount of inocula tended to reduce weedy establishment in the fourth year. Um, so it depends on your restoration goal. And how do you apply this inocula? You can till it, you can drill it, you can put inoculated plugs in, just find some way to incorporate it below that soil surface. And how long does it last? Um, it seems like these effects actually increase over time and we have some data up into year eight. So um, basically all that stuff again, AM fungi is awesome across all these different studies. Um, the ones, the starred ones here, the ones I talked about today, but we have a, a bunch of examples all showing the same thing that native mycorrhizal transplants work in restoration. But so after I presented this data for years and years and um, many people asked me where I could find these native microbes and the answer was always very unsatisfying such as, um, it's not really a thing yet, we're just using it in lab. Or, you know, if you know a prairie that they're gonna dig up and make a new road on or something, use that soil. Um, those are very unsatisfying answers. So I started my own business, which is MycoBloom, and I provide local ecotype uh, mycorrhizae from Midwest grasslands. I think today I'm the only um, provider of mycorrhizae from this ecosystem. So um, with that, I hope I convinced you that the key to the restoration of these late successional plants is the inclusion of old growth mycorrhizae from prairies. Um, so with that, I would just like to thank anyone um, who has given me money in the past, including KU, the Land Institute, Malone Family Foundation, and USDA. And with that, I um, will take any questions that have been in the chat. And I appreciate your time. Thank you so much, Liz. We appreciate your time today. Um, from the, the biological side of things to the practical application, there was definitely so much in there that we, we had uh, to learn from. And I know that um, we'll be taking this home and thinking about right now the perfect time for our planning status for our restoration projects coming um, this spring. So thank you so much. And we do have a number of questions that are coming through uh, in the chat. Now, hopefully, Liz, you don't mind staying on for a few more minutes. Oh, yeah. Um, thank you very much. Okay, so um, there's some that are clarification questions. When you were talking about the commercial versus um, like the um, created, uh, the I guess customized is the word, customized um, mycorrhiza mixes were by commercial, were you meaning the mic, M-Y-K-E? It was something that um, this person here has used in previous uh, restoration projects. So I have used, um, I've only done two projects where I myself has have tested um, commercial mycorrhizae. And um, so for the 2015 study that I have in Ecosphere, we used something called Plant Healthcare. And for the 2020 milkweed study, we used something called ProMix. And so those are the two trials that I have done for my academic research using um, commercial mycorrhizae. But if you look across all those different studies of um, commercial mycorrhizae and restoration, they use many, many, many different products. And there are dozens and dozens and dozens out there today. Um, so there's no consistent um, what 
inocula people use when they use commercial inocula. So it could be any number of those products that they bought off of Amazon or whatever. Okay, thank you for the clarification. And um, Kate is asking, how does the inoculated nurse plant work? Do you use a slurry from a donor prairie soil? And if so, what makes up that slurry? Yeah, so if we're doing whole soil, we what we would do is collect um, like a, a bucket of soil and, and sieve that and homogenize it. And then we put just a tablespoon of that whole soil in there. So it's just like the ground up stuff. Um, if we're using our lab cultures, that's a bit of a complicated um, answer there, how we grow our fungi. But essentially we grow our fungi, uh, our native fungi in the lab on native soil with native plants. And then we chop up um, at the end of the season that native soil. And so it's a granular thing still of native soil that we're putting um, as inocula onto those nurse plants. Um, so I myself have never done slurries. I, that's a restoration possibility, um, but I hate to give advice on things I haven't um, trialed myself, so. If someone does do it, please let us know. <laughs> um, okay, a uh, question from Mark. Um, do you know how quickly these AM fungi can spread within a site that has been lightly inoculated and will they migrate into a restoration site naturally in a fragmented landscape over time? Yes, so these fungi can move, and this is an exciting uh, new line of inquiry within the field of vibrisculum mycorrhizae. So we've had a couple data sets where we have assessed um, spread. So I presented one data set where we looked at just one meter away from those nurse plants, um, but we didn't see effects at one meter until year three. So that indicates they spread really slowly. Um, often these mycorrhizae are dispersed by things like worms and rodents that move them around. Some people argue that these fungi are spread through the air. Some of my researchers are working on capturing fungi from the wind, for example. Um, what they're finding is that a lot of the spores they collect are dead because these fungi are subterranean things. They don't like to dry out. They don't like the sun. So um, spreading out into the environment, we, we don't see that as a viable um, means of inoculation. Just like our native plants require generally seeds or our native restorations require seeds to be introduced. We think we also need to require microbes to be introduced because they're also dispersal limited. Okay, and we have a few questions that are asking for advice for restoration contractors. Um, just in general, what would you advise them for their next steps, um, whether it's from application or just the first steps and how do you select um, a fungi mix for a specific location and for the soils and so on. Any advice? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so, I mean, there's a couple of different approaches. One is, let's say you have, um, you know, a fill or a roadside that's new, that's been crazy disturbed. You can look at this mycorrhizal response database and possibly select plants that don't require mycorrhizae. So, um, if you're going to restore a roadside, I wouldn't spend a bunch of money on lead plant unless you're going to also include the microbes lead plant requires because it's very strongly mycorrhizal. So you could either forget about those plants that really care about mycorrhizae um, and microbes, or you can start to think about incorporating microbes if you also want those plants. So it depends on your restoration goal. If it is diversity, um, especially if orbs and legumes, you might want to consider adding microbes. Um, because these plants especially seem to be strongly responsive. In terms of choosing which products, of course, um, I always like to recommend, recommend mine. I'm not native to Canada, um, so the mycorrhizae that I sell via Michael Bloom are from the Great Lakes region, um, sort of Chicago, Illinois, Wisconsin area, so not too far, or I have a batch from Kansas and Missouri um, that I've been selling for restoration. <clears throat> but it's not so hard to conduct a trial um, if you have a greenhouse space. So that first pot study, it's not so hard to do. And you can trial um, different products if you want to make an informed decision or collaborate with some academic researchers or grad student who would love to do that with their time. Um, so that might be a way forward to get some of this trial-based research conducted. And for those who are um, rights of way managers in Eastern Ontario, if you're thinking about doing that, maybe contact us and see if that's something we can do with you with the restoration project this spring. 
Okay, um, another question here. Are forest and grassland mycorrhizae totally different species? Um, they're wondering if uh, mycorrhizae collected from forest soil can be used in grasslands. Yeah, so um, yes and no. So trees, forests um, tend to associate with endomycorrhizal fungi, which are the kind I work with. You, you can see in this background here. Some of them associate with these fungi. Others associate with a whole different kind of fungi called ectomycorrhizal fungi. And those tend to be the ones that make mushrooms and whatnot. Um, so it's a total different group of mycorrhizae. So it depends on the forest community that is your target goal and what um, trees might depend on what microbes. But I think this idea of microbial transplant has been tested in deciduous forests, um, especially in conifer forests. Those plants are strongly ectomycorrhizal. So often if you're buying um, conifer trees, they come with some inocula in it. They're really strongly mycorrhizal. But it's also been tested in other landscapes across the world. Um, I know of some examples in Africa and China and the Mediterranean, you name it. Um, this idea of moving microbes seems to work um, for restoring the native community, acquiring native or donor soil microbes. Um, so I think they're similar um, results, even though they might be slightly different microorganisms. And just two more questions very quick. Uh, would this give some good credit to transplanting plants that are slated for destruction? Was there a beginning to that? I'm sorry, sorry I might have cut no, out. It, sorry, I'm not <laughs> sure. Um, the question is, would this give some good credit to transplanting plants that are slated for destruction? Yeah, so um, that is a fantastic way to use inocula. Um, if you know of an area, for example, they expanded a new highway on-ramp um, not so far away from us in Kansas. And so we knew this was going to happen and we wrote a small grant to basically collect all that soil and we used it in a bunch of restoration trials and inoculation products. Um, and so, yeah, if it's possible to save things um, that are going to be necessarily destructed, um, yes, do that. But obviously, I think um, maybe I'm speaking to the wrong crowd, the roadside managers, but <clears throat> the strongest way we can protect and preserve these microbes and late seasonal plants is to not disturb them anymore. Um, so protect these plant species. All right. Okay, so um, my last question for you is whether or not it's okay to share your email with um, our, our attendees today if they have questions about whether mycobloom could be appropriate for their specific um, restoration site, because uh, we have some questions coming in about that. Sure, um, yeah, okay. um, it's mycobloom at gmail, it's up at the top there, and feel free to email me a second time if I missed your first email, so. <laughs> Wonderful, thank you so much. Uh, thank you so much for, for joining us today. Um, we had some fantastic engagement there. I certainly believe that there was a lot that we have learned. Um, and if we have more questions, maybe we can go back. I know that there were some things that you shared that I would love to be able to share it with the recording as well, um, that PDF and, and, and that sort of thing. Um, sure. So also thank you to everyone who joined us today and to our funder, uh, the Ontario Chilean Foundation for making this webinar series possible. And um, I will be in touch um, shortly with the recording so everyone can go back and, and uh, relearn again. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Thanks, thank everyone. you so much. It was a pleasure. Thank you.